My name is Gary Lambert. I live in Orville, Alabama, and I'm 42 years old. I was born in Bluefield, Virginia, which is above where I grew up, in Tazewell, Virginia. I grew up in the mountains of Virginia, and if you can ever imagine being different in the mountains of Virginia, it's, it's very, let's put it this way, it's a good thing I'm still alive because most people are surprised I survived. As a kid growing up in southwestern Virginia, and I do say southwestern Virginia because we were not West Virginia. It was hard. People who are different were not accepted in that part of the state, in the mountains. Um, it's just, it, it was difficult, especially knowing as a child that you're gay in that part of the country. I remember going up and visiting my great aunt Arbutus up in Buchanan County. That's where I had my first crush. <laughs> the guy that lived next door to her, he was probably my age, I should say, the kid that lived next door. We were probably 12. And he was, he was very nice. I knew I was different from very early on. I used to pray. Uh, I grew up Baptist. I'm still Baptist, believe it or not. But I used to pray to not be different, to not be gay. And I knew there was a time I wouldn't see my family anymore. As a teenager, I consumed a lot of my time at school. My parents were divorced. I didn't have a close relationship with my mother, so I didn't like to go home. So I took on a lot of extracurricular activities. Music was one of my favorite things to do. I, by the time I graduated high school, I played 11 different instruments, and I really enjoyed that, and that's what I had intended on going into when I went to the university. Funny thing is, my, um, my difference kind of stood out. I was a drum major, and, but then again, you know, you wear sequins on a football field and twirl a baton. How can people not know the real, real you? Well, I got involved with antiques with my first partner. Billy, he just, he really had an eye. We would, we would drive through the country. And of course, in the early 90s, Alabama hadn't changed much from like the 60s, I guess you would say. Uh, places in Wilcox County you'd drive up to and there'd still be a lady nursing a child on the front porch and naked children running around everywhere. And of course, the father and his overalls. And Billy would always stop and I'd, I'd keep a six pack of beer in the, the vehicle. That was the way to get the father to talk, so to speak, give him a beer. Billy, uh, he always wanted a grandfather clock, always. Ever since the first day I met him, that's all he ever talked about was a grandfather clock. I had sold a piece of furniture and I thought, well, I'm gonna go down to Natchez and I'm gonna buy me a big bed. And so we went down to Natchez and I found a bed and I bought it. I still had money left over. And so we thought, well, we'll just go antiquing and spend it. We, we bought a whole truckload of stuff. And anyway, the very last stop, they had a sofa in the window that I was interested in. And so we stopped and I looked at the sofa and in the back room was a grandfather clock. And the guy, he says, well, he says, it doesn't work. He said, uh, I'll take $800 for the clock. And poor Billy, he came up to me. His eyes was about as blue as the sky and looked at me. He says, please, please, please tell me we have $800. And, uh, of course, I told him, I said, I don't think we did. And realistically, I didn't know at the time. So he went to get us a soft drink from next door. And I went out to the truck and I, I counted the money. And I had $900 exactly. So I went ahead and I paid, paid the gentleman for the clock. And Billy came back in and anyway, he, he looked like he'd just been beat down. The world just beat him down. He found the one thing he'd always wanted and he, he knew he just couldn't get it. So uh, we got ready to leave and I said, well, you need to load your clock. And he, he was like a child at Christmas. It just, that's my favorite memory of him. And uh, had just enough money to get home, <laughs> just enough. The hardest thing to overcome, my partner, Billy and I, we'd been together right at 10 years both being HIV positive. It, it was um, in rural Alabama. It was difficult, but we made it work. But he quit taking his medication. He said it made him feel funny. And in 2002, he uh, passed away. 
people always think they know what they're going to do in a situation like that. You know, you, you have time to plan, but nothing ever gets you ready. I remember the nurse Alma. I couldn't have asked for a better nurse. But uh, Billy made a sound, and uh, Alma at that point said that he was gone. I, I told her, I said, he's still breathing, he's not gone. I thought I was prepared. But I wasn't. I don't ever talk about that much. Most people ask, you know, about my partner, and I say, well, it took me 10 years to kill him. It's just easier to laugh about it than, than to think about it. Well, today, what I'm doing in my life today is, is definitely not antiquing. I still buy antiques and I still sell them on the side, but uh, I'm an insurance agent. So I guess the next step up is running for mayor in Alabama. Well, they say you can be an insurance agent or a used car salesman, you can be a mayor. But, um, but no, I, I sell insurance and uh, thoroughly enjoy my job. And uh, restoring an old house here in Orville, Alabama. And just living in the country and living life large. So. Suddenly, without war. 